Hello and welcome everyone to Farming Matters. I'm Erin Schneider. I am your host of Farming Matters. I work with the North Central SARE program and I also farm in Wisconsin. I'm here today with Marie Flanagan, um, the producer and creator of the show. Hey Marie. Hello everyone. <laughs> and our very special guest today is farmer Eric Jellum with the Jellum Farm in Iowa. Eric is going to share us share with us um, his SARE project which is all about establishing a temperature gradient to enhance geothermal heating and cooling of a high tunnel. So Eric, thanks for taking the time just to tell us a little bit about your farm, what led you to this idea, what you kind of learned and advice you would have for others. Well, my interest in in geothermal started uh, at least 25 years ago. We've had a, a geothermal heat pump system for our home and uh, I've been, fascinated with how it works and how inexpensive the energy produced is. And uh, I've used it in other ways on our home too. So it's been a, an interest that's become kind of a passion of mine. Yeah, the, the farm is just a small quarter section farm. I farm with my brother. Uh, he lives about five miles away. And uh, we're, we're corn and soybeans now. We used to have some livestock, but uh, don't have the livestock anymore. Uh, the corn drying is something that I developed an interest in uh, quite a few years before I actually got the project and, and did drying. So I dried a lot of corn on the computer <laughs> and it it uh, got dry each time I did it. And uh, so eventually I thought, I, I need to try this. You know, this, this seems to work out. And I've tried to um, tried to talk myself into it not working and not successfully. So I finally got the SARE project and tried it, and it it worked out well. I know that you kind of did a real deep dive into the design and figuring out how to set the system up. High tunnels are often called season extenders because of the warmer than ambient temperatures within the high tunnel but there is increasing interest in continuing production throughout the winter. Even maintaining a modest temperature threshold can be costly if heating with LP. Geothermal heat could be ideally suited to this. This graph shows a comparative amount of heat that can be produced for a dollar from different heat sources. The cost for heating with electricity versus LP has generally favored LP in recent decades. An exception to this is geothermal heat pump systems. The heat pump is the expensive part of the system to operate, but is necessary to elevate temperatures of inexpensive low temperature ground heat to comfortable levels. But if a lower temperature heat source is adequate, geothermal heat without a heat pump can be far more economical and energy efficient. There are heating applications in which ground temperatures are high enough to meet heating requirements even without a heat pump. An example should help illustrate this. A project funded by USDA SARE to dry corn slowly through the winter showed that a 60 watt circulating pump for the eight foot deep and 800 foot long ground loop delivered enough geothermal heat to increase the temperature of the drying air stream an average of eight to 10 degrees for two to 5% of what the cost would have been using LP, and the system has successfully dried corn for six years. I wanted to see how well this success might transfer to greenhouse heating. Geothermal greenhouse heating mainly uses air tubes to collect the heat. Although using air makes inherent sense, liquid systems to collect ground heat remain a geothermal industry standard, and my experience drying corn led me to favor a liquid system. Not being a produce grower myself, I was happy to connect with a local produce grower, Steve Strassheim of Twisted River Farm. This led to another USDA SARE project. Steve has extensively described agronomic labor and marketing experience in the project report. The focus in this summary will be on the geothermal heating system. The high tunnel heating system was designed using different considerations than those used for the corn drying ground heat collection loop. 
Even though the corn drying loop is 8 feet deep, it is affected by ambient conditions at the surface. As surface temperatures get colder during the winter, ground temperatures and heating capacities also decline throughout the winter. In contrast, after the winter solstice in December, solar radiation increases. Since the high tunnel is a solar collector and can become excessively warm on sunny days, even in midwinter, the ability to recover excess heat for storage in the soil seemed like enough advantage to place the ground loop beneath the footprint of the high tunnel. This made it possible to use the thermal mass of the ground as a heat source at night, which could be partially restored by recovering excess heat during sunny days. Because of the proximity of the high tunnel to the corn drying ground loop, the two systems were connected during installation. The high tunnel geothermal system was installed before building the 30 foot by 54 foot tunnel during the summer of 2021. Although the design of the high tunnel system seemed sound, implementation problems resulting from mistakes in judgment and a natural disaster soon became apparent and altered the project goals. These problems are described in the report. Fortunately, the connection between the high tunnel and corn drying systems was done during installation. In the project's second year, the inner high tunnel loop, which remained functional, was connected to one of the two heat exchangers and the dryer loop was connected to the other. The two systems operated independently but in concert to heat the high tunnel using a commonly shared fan. Although the misfortunes resulted in the abandonment of part of the project goal, the connection of the two systems still provided an opportunity to test geothermal heating. Project results are shown for only the project's second year and only during January when the coldest temperatures occurred. The two geothermal loops working together kept temperatures above the hoped for 20 degree threshold except for one night in late January when high tunnel temperatures bottomed out at 16.4 degrees and the outside air temperature was below minus 20. Heat output from the heat exchangers ranged from 20,000 to 36,000 BTUs per hour, costing about 3 to 5 percent of what it would have cost using LP at $1.50 a gallon. This was similar to the results of the corn drying project. It is worth noting on the graph that even when the temperature in the tunnel dipped below the 20 degree threshold at night, daytime temperatures reached nearly 70 degrees, far higher than what might be desired, and squandering heat by conduction through the high tunnel envelope that could have been stored in the ground at night. This points out the need for more heat exchange capacity in the high tunnel. Had more of the excess solar heat been stored for use at night, the high tunnel temperature probably would have been kept above the 20 degree threshold. Other possibilities for significant design improvements provide good reason for optimism. Careful considerations should be given to the depth in the ground where the temperatures remain highest during the winter when heat requirements are greatest. As this graph suggests, deep placement of ground loops or the use of groundwater is normally best. The unique circumstances that exist for high tunnel were much of the basis for the proposed geothermal design in the current project. Because of the misfortunes, this system has yet to be tested. The current project's goal is to generate geothermal heat in a greenhouse application, but heat retention at night with some kind of thermal blanket should also be a major focus to help minimize the capital cost of a geothermal system or increase the achievable temperatures. Likewise, the high tunnel design could be better if winter production is planned. Good year-round greenhouse designs are available for cold climates. Combining better placement of ground loops or groundwater use to access ground stored heat, better diurnal capture of excess solar heat in the high tunnel, and increasing heat retention at night should be very attainable, cost-effective, and adequate to reach modest temperature maintenance goals. 
This USDA SARE funded research should be considered part of an early stage of an ongoing effort to contribute to the results of, from other projects working to minimize costs and very greatly minimize dependence on fossil energy sources to encourage local production throughout the year, even in cold climates. What are the quintessential kind of like checklists that you would offer to farmers who are like, oh, I want to try this out as well? I guess I'm not a fan of a vertical slinky. Mm -hmm. uh, for one thing, you know, each of those loops, when it's in a vertical orientation rather than a horizontal slinky, uh, they, they can accumulate micro bubbles at the top of each loop. And so those micro bubbles can become macro bubbles and there can be an air bladder at the top of each loop and that can slow down flow. And uh, I found out after installing the system that vertical slinkies have kind of gone out of favor with the geothermal industry. So I, I think my inclination would be either to use a horizontal slinky or just to dig out the entire uh, contents of the pit and lay them in large loops so that they're as equally spaced as possible. Um, then you're not so dependent on high thermal conductivity in the soil to reach the, the pipe and transfer heat. Um, that's the part of the system that was unfortunate that didn't get tested. I still would like to test it because it still seems like a sound idea. Um, putting, if you use drip tape, for keeping the soil wet, you know, putting it inside of a, a drain tile to keep it from crushing, or maybe using a, an irrigation line that's designed for deep replacement uh, would probably work out and maybe do some sub irrigating of the crop. So, those would be, you know, the two installation changes that I would make. The uh, the thermal curtain, I think, could be done fairly simply, although that, that would take a little monkeying around to, to have something that would come across maybe at the bottom of the trusses of the, of the greenhouse frame mm -hmm. uh, so that the heat blowing off the fan could go underneath the thermal curtain. Uh, Steve, you know, on really cold nights, he would be inclined to, to pull a a thermal blanket across the top of the crop and just the floating row cover to lay it on the surface. But that makes it hard for the heat to be down where the crop is. So I think something that would, um, a curtain that would move across from wall to wall at the, the bottom of the truss would allow the isolation of the crop and still be able to blow heat off of the, the heat exchangers underneath the thermal curtain. Beyond that, uh, there are other geothermal installations that are open loop and our, our home operates on an open loop. So it, it requires good enough water quality, but our home is fed by water coming out of our well. We have two wells, one's dedicated to the heat pump in the house. And that uh, is just pumped to the heat pump and down a tile line. You could do the same thing in a greenhouse, uh, although you probably don't want uh, unprotected water, unprotected by antifreeze water that could be frozen. You know, if water flow ceases, um, you want to have some antifreeze in there or you want to have a power backup system that uh, can come right on. We don't, so the antifreeze is important. And uh, there are, there is a, a device that I've just really become aware of that's made uh, out of San Jose, California. And it's called a closed loop advection device. And it, it pumps water out of one well through a heat exchanger in the well casing. And then that water goes down another well from that heat exchanger, there is another closed loop that has uh, antifreeze that goes to the point of use, which by design is normally going to be a, a heat pump. 
but it could also be heat exchangers for drying corn or heating a greenhouse as well. And there you're you're well protected by a high concentration of antifreeze. <laughs> you're also not having to put as much antifreeze underground as the current loop has. You know, the, the dryer loop has got a volume of 65 to 70 gallons, and it's a 23% antifreeze solution, propylene glycol in this case. Uh, you wouldn't be as risk if you're just using fresh water in a short loop from a device like I described. So that seems like a pretty good option to consider. Uh, with directional boring machines, uh, you could even retrofit greenhouse loops installed at whatever depth um, is desirable. And, and the, what I would desire, I think, would be about 15 feet. The period in when the temperature peaks at 15 feet is enough later than in the middle of summer when the air temperatures peak. Mm -hmm. So it corresponds to... Uh, about the beginning of the heating season. And the amplitude of the temperature oscillation is small enough that even though it decreases late in the winter below the average ground temperature, it's still not much below average. So that's uh, a depth that has become industry standard for use with the directional boring machines. So that could be put underneath the greenhouse loop or underneath the greenhouse footprint or external to it. It seems like circulating air would have fewer complications than circulating water. So I was wondering why um, circulating water in your system would be preferable. Is it preferable to you? Yeah, and it's not necessarily preferable. It's just, it's different. I mean, I had good success with the liquid system in the corn dryer, and you know, the liquid systems are still standard uh, for geothermal systems in the industry. So I was aware of a number of greenhouses using um, air tubes, just circulating air through uh, tile lines, basically, and they seem to be working well. Uh, I was a little afraid of having air tubes buried in the ground mm -hmm. and collecting moisture mm -hmm. and starting to mildew and mold and having mold spores coming up and not being able to do anything about it. Uh, having a liquid system where the heat exchangers were at the surface and I could clean them periodically uh, gave me some comfort. Uh, the air tubes certainly don't have the freezing issue that a liquid system has that you, where you'd have to maintain a high enough concentration of, of antifreeze in it. Uh, but you, with a liquid system, you also have an option of going quite deep with your tubes. If you wanted to go down to 15 feet, for example, air tubes would be a little difficult. You'd almost have to dig a pit to put them down at that depth. And you know, an open loop where you could pump well water out is is an option. And again, it's a, a liquid system. So I, I'm not opposed to air. I just thought <laughs> it might be good to try a liquid system and and uh, to know exactly how it compares with air systems. You'd almost have to have side by sides in the same size greenhouse, same location, same climate. And uh, that takes more budget than I've got. <laughs> <laughs> What's your like ballpark estimate of like the energy savings of this for heating? Like if you don't not without knowing an exact number, just like you know, on average, you're like, oh kind of. well, I mean it, you can do a ballpark just on my my comments in the dryer project and the greenhouse project of you know three to five percent of what it would cost using LP. Um when I look at the amount of heat that's being put back on the ground during these sunny days now, uh, even though we haven't had a lot of requirement at night for heating, so it doesn't come on much at night, it's, and there's not much opportunity to, to see how much is put out at night, but 
how much you're putting back in the ground should correspond to what you're getting out of it at night. Mm -hmm. And to to go out and measure 40 to 50,000 BTUs per hour for four cents an hour, um, that doesn't seem too bad to me. Mm -hmm. So the operating cost of a system like this is not very great. The upfront cost, the capital cost, is what's going to be most of the cost. And I, I'm still trying to pin down uh, just what the capacity is for for corn drying. I mean, I, I know I had too big a system. I had a 3,000 bushel bin I was drying corn in. I'm guessing that it could probably do 10,000 with the size loop that I've got. Uh, so if the, the total cost, which includes the capital cost and the operating cost, it, it's mostly capital cost. Mm. The energy savings... You know, it's, it, the fossil energy savings is very great. You know, so where we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint, uh, this has a tremendous capacity to contribute to that effort.